now to North Korea. Some rare pictures are coming out from the country. The In a world dotted with nations defined by their landmarks, customs, and cultures, one country remains an enigma, almost trapped in its own time capsule. Nestled in the heart of Asia is North Korea, a land of deep-rooted traditions, paradoxes, and peculiarities that defy modern norms. As you navigate your global knowledge, are you ready to uncover the strange and unique aspects that are exclusive to this isolated state? Delve with us as we explore 10 bewildering things that exist only in North Korea. Number 1. Cult of Personality and Eternal Leaders In the annals of history, few dynasties have wielded power and perpetuated their legacy quite like North Korea's Kim Dynasty. Spanning three generations from Kim Il-sung to Kim Jong-un, the reign of the Kims has been a masterclass in the creation and sustenance of a cult of personality. Central to this cult is the portrayal of the leaders not merely as political figures, but as godlike entities. This deification is omnipresent throughout North Korea. From murals to statues and from textbooks to songs, the Kims are presented as infallible beings who, by divine right or destiny, are the true guardians and saviors of the North Korean people. To reinforce this larger-than-life image, North Korea is dotted with colossal public monuments dedicated to the leaders. The Mansu Hill Grand Monument in Pyongyang, with its towering bronze statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, is perhaps the most iconic of them all. These monuments are not just for show. They are pilgrimage sites where citizens, including schoolchildren, are often taken to pay their respects and participate in orchestrated rituals, demonstrating unwavering loyalty and reverence. Behind these grand displays lies a deeply entrenched ideology that positions the leaders as eternal. Even after their demise, they are believed to continue watching over the nation. Kim Il-sung, for instance, was declared eternal president posthumously, ensuring that his legacy and image remain undiminished in the nation's psyche. This ideology, rooted in the interplay of fear, reverence, and genuine admiration, has profound effects on the masses, shaping their worldview, behaviors, and, in many ways, their very identity as North Korean citizens. Number 2. The Songbun Caste System Based on Loyalty Diving deep into the societal intricacies of North Korea, one cannot overlook the Songbun system a deeply entrenched social classification mechanism rooted in the nation's history. Originating from the 1950s, the Songbun system was initially intended to categorize families based on their political loyalty to the state during its foundational years, especially during the Korean War. Over time, it has crystallized into a permanent caste system that permeates every facet of a North Korean citizen's life. The structure of the Songbun system bifurcates the population into three broad categories, the core, wavering, and hostile classes. The core class typically consists of families who have historically demonstrated unwavering loyalty to the ruling party, often reaping the benefits of such allegiance. Those in the wavering category might have mixed histories, perhaps with some distant family ties to South Korea or minor historical infractions. However, the most marginalized are those in the hostile class. This class includes families with any historical ties to Japan, those who opposed the communist revolution, and even families of individuals who have defected. Being categorized in the hostile class has severe repercussions. From limited access to educational opportunities and desirable employment, to restrictions on residing in the capital city of Pyongyang, these citizens find their life choices heavily constrained. Such systematic discrimination doesn't end with just economic opportunities. It's also reflected in their treatment by local authorities, access to food distributions, and even their eligibility for party membership. In essence, a hostile classification isn't just a tag. It's a life sentence of diminished opportunities and constant suspicion. Number three, traffic ladies, the human traffic signals. While North Korea may be a land of numerous peculiarities, one of the most visually striking aspects that captivate visitors to the country's capital, Pyongyang, is the sight of its iconic female traffic controllers. 
Stationed at the center of large intersections, these women, dressed in crisp uniforms, command the flow of vehicles with precise hand movements and spins, an image in sharp contrast to the typical traffic lights seen around the world. But why has North Korea, a nation known for its military prowess and nuclear ambitions, opted for such a manual system? The presence of these traffic ladies, as they are often referred to, can be traced back to both practical and symbolic reasons. From a practical standpoint, North Korea's chronic power shortages make relying solely on electronic traffic lights risky. An unexpected power outage could lead to chaos on the roads. Having human controllers ensures that traffic is managed efficiently, even during outages. Symbolically, these traffic ladies serve as a testament to the nation's resilience and self-reliance. They embody the Juke ideology, North Korea's governing philosophy which emphasizes independence and self-sustainability. Rather than simply installing battery-operated traffic lights or generators, the regime has chosen a solution that showcases the diligence and discipline of its citizens, making them an integral part of the urban landscape and a representation of the nation's unique character. Number 4. Controlled Education and Restricted Knowledge North Korea's education system stands as one of the most tightly controlled and restricted in the world, acting as a conduit for state propaganda. The curriculum, meticulously crafted by the regime, is steeped in propaganda, embedding a sense of reverence for the ruling Kim dynasty from an early age. From textbooks to classroom lectures, the content is carefully curated to showcase the leadership in a godlike aura, often attributing supernatural events or talents to them. Stories of their feats, their sacrifices for the nation, and their pioneering vision are embedded in every lesson, fostering an undying loyalty among the young minds. A striking feature of their educational structure is the glaring absence of global history. Instead of learning about world wars, international relations, or global milestones, students are taught an alternate version where North Korean triumphs are highlighted. Key events in global history, where North Korea didn't shine or emerged as the antagonist, are either heavily altered or completely omitted. This has the dual effect of nurturing national pride while ensuring that generations grow up with a skewed understanding of their nation's position in the global context. The state's rendition of world events is perhaps most evident in its portrayal of the Korean War. Instead of providing a holistic view of the events leading up to the war, its progression, and its aftermath, North Korean textbooks assert that the South, in collaboration with the U.S., initiated the aggression. By doing so, the regime successfully ingrains a deep-rooted mistrust of the Western world and fortifies the narrative of North Korea as the resilient, self-reliant nation constantly under threat. This controlled education not only shapes the worldview of its citizens, but also ensures that any seeds of dissent or alternate perspectives are nipped in the bud. Number 5. Fashion and Appearance – State-Controlled Identity In North Korea, personal identity is curtailed significantly, especially when it comes to fashion and appearance. Fashion is more than a mere personal expression in this closed society. It's a reflection of the country's politics, ideology, and commitment to the ruling regime. The state has stringent rules about what's deemed acceptable, and deviations are not merely frowned upon but actively punished. One of the most symbolic bans in terms of clothing is the prohibition of Western attire, particularly jeans. Blue jeans, symbolic of American culture, are seen as a representation of capitalism and hence are forbidden. The ideology behind this is clear a rejection of Western values and culture. Instead, traditional Korean attire, especially on significant occasions, is encouraged, promoting a uniform identity that reflects nationalistic pride and purity. But it's not just clothing where the state has a say. Hairstyles, too, are under the government's purview. North Koreans don't have the liberty to style their hair any way they wish. The government provides a selection of state-approved haircuts, both for men and women. These haircuts are standardized and are perceived to be morally upright and traditionally Korean. The rationale is to prevent Western hairstyles and decadent influences from permeating the society, and to ensure these rules are followed, fashion police are actively on the lookout. These are not metaphorical police. Actual officials patrol streets and public spaces to enforce these codes of appearance. Non-compliance doesn't just result in a telling off, 
it could lead to public shaming, fines, or even worse. Number six, internet censorship and North Korean computing system. In contrast to the global internet, which connects billions of users worldwide and hosts an almost endless stream of information, North Korea has meticulously crafted its own insular digital universe. It operates a unique intranet system known as Kwang Myong. This closed network is entirely state-controlled and is isolated from the World Wide Web. Unlike the Internet, where content is vast and diverse, Kwang Myong offers only a limited number of domestic websites and services. These websites are carefully curated to align with the state's propaganda and offer information that primarily praises the regime and its achievements. Given that global websites pose a potential threat to the regime's narratives, North Koreans are restricted from accessing the open Internet. Instead, the Internet they connect to offers a few state-approved websites which are designed to educate citizens about the state's version of history, science, and culture, among other subjects. Some of these sites showcase North Korean films, music, and literature, all of which serve to further ingrain state ideologies. This tight grip on information flow doesn't just restrict access to foreign sites, it plays a strategic role in shaping the perceptions and beliefs of North Korean citizens. By controlling the content they can view, the regime ensures that only a state-approved version of reality is presented, effectively blocking any external influences that might challenge their narrative or undermine their authority. Number 7. K-pop's Lethality and the Ban on Foreign Media In North Korea, the glitzy, upbeat world of K-pop is seen as more than just music. It's a threat. A manifestation of South Korean cultural influence, K-pop and other South Korean cultural imports have been in the crosshairs of North Korea's regime for years. The state perceives these cultural phenomena as tools designed to undermine and challenge the ideologies upon which North Korea stands. Their catchy tunes and captivating visuals aren't just songs and dances, they're vehicles for values and lifestyles that starkly contrast the disciplined, austere society the North Korean regime has tried to maintain. As part of their efforts to suppress South Korean cultural invasion, the North Korean government has gone to great lengths to keep K-pop and its fervent fandom out of the country. Radios and televisions in North Korea are hardwired to receive only state broadcasts, thereby limiting external cultural influence. USBs, CDs, and other digital storage devices containing K-pop songs or dramas are smuggled at perilous risks. Anyone found in possession of such items can face severe consequences, ranging from public shaming sessions to labor camps, and in extreme cases, even execution. This outright ban on foreign media extends beyond just K-pop. Western films, music, and television shows are equally forbidden. For the North Korean regime, controlling the information and media landscape is crucial. Any exposure to foreign media is seen as a potential threat that can plant the seeds of dissent and disillusionment among its people. While the state projects an image of superiority and self-sufficiency, foreign media, with their depictions of affluent, free, and modern societies, can puncture this facade. As a result, consuming foreign content isn't just a pastime. For North Koreans, it's a life-threatening act of defiance against a regime that tolerates no challenge to its supremacy. Number 8. Basketball. Kim Jong-un's Game. Few leaders in history have shown the kind of passionate obsession for a sport as Kim Jong-un does for basketball. From his early years spent studying in Switzerland, Kim developed a deep fondness for the game, particularly for the NBA. This fascination wasn't merely a phase, but one that he carried with him as he rose to power. Stories of his collection of NBA memorabilia, including jerseys and signed basketballs, have circulated for years, underscoring his admiration for the sport and its stars, like Michael Jordan and Dennis Rodman. In fact, Rodman's several trips to North Korea, described by some as basketball diplomacy, further revealed the depths of Kim's basketball fandom. But in North Korea, basketball isn't just played, it's modified. The country follows a set of distinctive rules that diverge notably from international standards. For instance, slam dunks in North Korean basketball aren't worth the usual two points but a solid three. Another quirky rule is the deduction of points. If a player misses a free throw, a point is taken away, an unprecedented rule that adds another layer of pressure to what is often seen as a crucial and sometimes game-deciding shot in standard basketball. 
Three-point shots, if made during the final three minutes of a game, rack up an impressive four points, turning the end game into a high-stakes shooting challenge. Such peculiarities in the rules significantly alter the game's dynamics. Teams have to adapt their strategies, keeping in mind the potential gains and pitfalls these unique regulations introduce. The elevated value of certain shots means that teams might prioritize them over traditionally safer plays. Defensive tactics also evolve, as preventing a slam dunk or a late-game three-pointer becomes even more crucial. This version of basketball, infused with North Korean idiosyncrasies, offers a curious yet fascinating glimpse into how the country shapes and tailors even the most globally recognized sports to fit its own narrative and tastes. Number 9. Time Traveling, North Korean Calendar and Time Zone While most of the world operates under the Gregorian calendar, North Korea has adopted a different chronological system, one that deeply intertwines with its ideology the Juch calendar. This calendar was introduced in 1997 and starts from the birth year of the founder and eternal president, Kim Il-sung, in 1912. Consequently, the year 1912 when Kim Il-sung was born is referred to as Juch 1. In this system, 2022 would be marked as Juch 110. The Juch calendar is more than a mere method of marking time. It symbolizes the country's self-reliance ideology. Juche literally translates to self-reliance and is a central pillar of North Korean state philosophy. By embedding this philosophy into the very way they measure time, it serves as a constant reminder to the North Korean populace of the nation's guiding principles and the legacy of Kim Il-sung. Yet the divergence from global standards doesn't end with the calendar. In 2015, North Korea introduced its own time zone known as Pyongyang time. This move set the country's clock back by 30 minutes compared to South Korea and Japan. The change was more than just practical, it was symbolic. North Korea declared that this was a break from the wicked Japanese imperialists, referencing Japan's colonization of Korea from 1910 to 1945, when the entire peninsula was set to Japan's time zone. These shifts in the calendar and time zone have profound cultural implications, for the citizens, it reinforces the idea of North Korean exceptionalism and deepens the divide, both ideologically and literally, from the rest of the world. On a daily basis, these changes might seem trivial, but they play a part in the grander scheme of North Korean statecraft, emphasizing the country's distinct identity and its resilience against foreign influences. While for outsiders, these might seem like mere eccentricities, for North Koreans, they are part of a larger narrative that defines their nationhood and identity. Number 10. The Ghost Skyscraper, Ragyong Hotel North Korea, despite its closed-off nature, hasn't been completely averse to grand architectural ambitions. One of its most colossal yet enigmatic structures is the Ryugyong Hotel in Pyongyang. Sprouting as a glass pyramid amidst the city's skyline, its historical context traces back to the 1980s. Conceived initially as a testament to North Korea's economic and architectural prowess, its construction commenced in 1987. North Korea's intent was clear. The hotel was to be one of the world's tallest structures, a 105-story edifice that would dwarf many contemporary skyscrapers. However, despite its grand beginnings, the Ryugyong Hotel turned into an emblem of architectural hiatus. By 1992, Amidst financial troubles and the sudden collapse of its chief economic supporter, the Soviet Union, construction halted. For over a decade, the hotel remained a bare, unfinished concrete shell, lacking windows or even interior fittings. The skeletal frame earned it the moniker of the Ghost Skyscraper. In the mid-2000s, there were efforts to revive its construction, with Egyptian telecommunications entity Oriscom jumping in to give the exterior a facelift. The gleaming glass panels were installed, giving the facade a sense of completion. But the interiors remained untouched and uninhabitable. The Ryogyong Hotel's stagnant state is not just an architectural oddity, but it symbolizes North Korea's economic challenges and overreaching ambitions that were never fully realized. While initially aimed to showcase dominance, the unfinished megastructure became an unintended metaphor for the country's isolation from the global stage. For many outside observers, the towering hotel encapsulates the contradictions of North Korea. 
showcasing grandeur while struggling with internal inefficiencies. International reactions have been a mix of awe, pity, and intrigue. Architects, tourists, and geopolitical analysts alike wonder if this massive pyramid will ever fulfill its intended purpose or continue to remain Pyongyang's mysterious ghostly sentinel. Thanks for watching another episode. While you are still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more quality content.